Not sure whether I should be thanking the organizers for inviting me because, after all, I'm in a sense part of the organizers as part of the scientific committee. But um, yeah, thanks for having me anyway. Um, so um, let me just give you a little background to what I'm, to what I'm going to talk about. So um, as we all know very well. Um, Epidemic models um, each have a quantity, which is the um, uh, basic reproduction number R0, okay, which is defined to be the average number of new infections caused by an infectious individual. Now, the basic um, facts are that if R0 is greater than 1, then even starting from a single infective, the epidemic may grow exponentially and infect uh, much of the population. Uh, we call that a supercritical uh, successful epidemic. On the other hand, if R0 is less than 1, then the outbreak will not take off, and that we can call a um, subcritical or a doomed epidemic. So. Um, in a large population, while we have only very few infectives, uh, we can analyze um, the, both in the supercritical and subcritical uh, cases, the, uh, those early stages of the epidemic um, successfully, um, for instance, through comparisons with um, branching processes. Uh, on the other hand, if the epidemic does take off and we reach a stage when there are many um, infectious individuals in the system, then the process can, um, well, in simple enough models, often be approximated by differential equations for a law of large numbers. <clears throat> Okay, now, um, if you have a closed population, a stochastic model, so there are no births, no immigration, then um, um, no matter whether our naught is uh, greater than one or less than one, the um, epidemic is ultimately doomed because we don't have enough of a pool of um, susceptible individuals to keep it going. Um, however, if um, um, R naught is greater than one and you have a large population, even if closed, it may take a long time and you may first get a uh, quite a large outbreak in the population before it finally dies out. On the other hand, if you have an open population and with births and immigrations, etc., and R naught is greater than one, then it's possible to, uh, for the disease to become endemic. And um, of course, things get even more complicated in reality because in real models, um, R naught is probably rarely constant, but it will vary over time depending on, on the, any measures people employ to control your disease and any, any particular location in which it's spreading, etc., and all kinds of other things. Factors. Okay, now um, partly because of that and <clears throat> partly for other reasons, often you are confronted with epidemics that are not going to be straightforwardly supercritical or subcritical, but um, uh, during the course uh, may cross the threshold um, where R0 is equal to 1, for instance, from above. So if epidemic is already going for quite a long time and it's quite successful, but then um, health officials introduce some control measures as, as vaccination, for, for example, or quarantine, etc. And or you can equally cross the threshold are not equal to one from below. So if you have a um, subcritical epidemic which is not taking off, but then it might become more infectious because of a mutation or change of behavior in the population, I don't know, change of weather conditions, etc. Now, so um, one way to study um, transition across the threshold in a large population, um, say population of size n, is to think of the um, parameters such as infection rate and duration of infectious period and et cetera as uh, being somehow functions of the um, population size n. Okay, so I want to explore this um, idea in the context of a, a couple of simple models of SIS epidemics. Okay, so um, in an SIS epidemic, uh, so each individual is of one of the following types, susceptible or infective, and um, what happens is that you get a disease and when you recover from it, you become susceptible again. Um, 
So you use that for models of diseases where there's no lasting immunity, for the recovery, um, such as uh, um, norovirus, or maybe also the coronavirus, um, I don't know. Um, so uh, mathematically, though, uh, these SIS models are equivalent to um, contact processes, which go back to Harris in 1974. Um, so I want to think of a very, very, the simplest possible model of an SIS epidemic in population of size n. Okay, so this is the um, stochastic logistic um, SIS epidemic. So here we have um, n individuals who we, um, we track x n of t, which is the number of infective individuals at time t. And we assume uniform mixing in the population. So um, each infective individual encounters a random other member of the population at some rate lambda greater than zero. If the person uh, they meet is currently susceptible, then they become infective. So that means that the number of infectives x n of t will increase um, by one, okay, at rate lambda times x n of t times the probability that the individual you encounter is susceptible, which is one minus x n of t over n. Okay. Now, also we have uh, recoveries. Recoveries happen at rate mu, and uh, what, again, independently of the infections, etc., and independent for each person. And whenever an infective person recovers, they join the uh, pool of susceptibles again. Okay, now there's a corresponding deterministic model. Um, so you can think of it as corresponding to an infinite population. And we track um, x of t, which is the proportion of infective individuals at time t. And again, each infective individual encounters a random other member of the population at rate lambda. If the person they meet is susceptible, they become infective. And again, you've got recoveries at rate mu. And, uh, and that leads to um, the proportion of um, uh, infective individuals, x of t, satis satisfying uh, this well-known uh, differential equation, the logistic equation, okay? Right, so um, this equation is already very well understood. So uh, basically there are uh, two main regimes. If the um, recovery rate mu is greater than equal to lambda, then there is an attractive fixed point at zero. And so from, where, from wherever you start, um, your solution x of t will tend to zero as t goes to infinity, so the epidemic dies out. On the other hand, if the uh, infection rate lambda is strictly greater than mu, then the fixed point at zero becomes repelling, and uh, instead there's an attractive fixed point at one minus mu over lambda, and uh, unless you uh, start with x of zero equal to zero, the solution will converge to this uh, fixed point, so the epidemic uh, becomes endemic in the population. Now, um, in fact, one can say a bit more. Uh, the differential equation is uh, simple enough that it's got an explicit solution, so one can see everything what's happening from, from that formula uh, I've given. Um, basic thing is that uh, if, as long as mu is not equal to lambda, then um, the convergence to either fixed point uh, happens uh, at an exponential rate, and uh, the rate is um, basically mu minus lambda or lambda minus mu, depending on which of these is um, uh, positive. And on the other hand, the mu equal to lambda, which is kind of the critical case, um, you don't have the exponential decay. Um, instead, the, the decay to zero is at rate uh, one over t, okay? Um, so, now, what about the stochastic model? So, um, and the stochastic logistic epidemic, um, you can write it down as a Markov chain, and you can find that if you look at the, um, the drift in the proportion x n of t over n of infective uh, individuals uh, at time uh, t, um, is basically the same as the right-hand side of the differential equation. So you think of the proportion of the um, infectives in the stochastic model corresponding to the proportion of the infectives in the deterministic model. 
Okay, now, so it's reasonable to think that um, the behavior of the stochastic and deterministic model will have something to do with each other. Um, and now let's see how much they have to do with each other. So one can look at the sequence of these stochastic epidemic models, one for each value of n, and assume that the initial number um, uh, of infectives is such that the um, proportion tends to the initial condition of the differential equation. And then uh, it's very easy to, to prove by standard techniques, but at least over bounded intervals, uh, the uh, random proportion of um, infectives in the stochastic model is well approximated by the deterministic uh, solution to the differential equation of the same initial condition. Okay, now during a constant length interval, the number of jumps in the process, um, in the random process is typically of order n. And uh, it doesn't really take us anywhere near to the end of the epidemic. So you may want to know what happens over longer time intervals, perhaps even all the way until the end of the epidemic. Um, okay, so um, as for the um, deterministic system, the key parameter is um, the ratio lambda over mu, which is um, the um, basic reproduction number, are not in this case. And the fact that so we care whether it's greater or less than one, although the significance is not going to be exactly the same as in the stochastic model. So um, again, the stochastic, as I said earlier, if you have an epidemic in a closed population, whether or not it's greater than one or less than one, it's doomed. And so that's what we have here. We have a closed population um, with a basically finite state space Markov chain, and um, with probability one, the Markov chain will eventually get absorbed in the state zero, i.e. epidemic will die out. And that happens even if r not is greater than one. Now, the significance of the value of R0 is that it affects how long it takes for the epidemic to die out and what exactly it will do before dying out. Okay, so let's look at the time to extinction uh, for Xn of t, i.e. the hitting time of the absorbing state zero. So uh, let's first think of the case lambda greater than mu, which is R0 greater than 1. So, um, as long as you start um, with enough infected individuals, so um, if xn of zero uh, tends to infinity, as n goes to infinity, then the, um, the expectation of the time to extinction is going to be um, basically very large, exponential in n. So, it will behave like e to some constant times n um, over square root of n times some constant, where the constant um, gamma in the exponent is some um, function of uh, the uh, in infection, uh, basically some function of R0, and it's such a function of R0 that it tends to zero as R0 tends to one, okay? And moreover, one can say that the time to extinction is asymptotically distributed as an exponential random variable, okay? And uh, that's well known for quite a long time. Uh, goes back to a um, paper of Barber in 76 and also Anderson and Jehisher in 1998. And uh, there's a, there's a recent account of the, um, uh, by this logistic epidemic model uh, in the book of Nazel from 2011. So, okay, so conditioning um, uh, on the event that the chain has not been absorbed in a state zero by time t, one can obtain so-called um, quasi-station distribution, which is centered around the attractive fixed point of a differential equation. And what happens if you start from anywhere, you will rapidly converge to this quasi-stationary distribution. But, but then moving from there to, um, uh, to zero, from moving from around the stationary, sorry, moving, moving from around the quasi station distribution, which is focused around this, um, um, the non trivial fixed point of a differential equation, from there to move to zero is going to be quite a rare event. So you're going to make some excursions and eventually you'll hit zero, and um, the time for this can be estimated very precisely, as I just said. And in fact, one can show that um, um, by being more careful than the standard analysis of um, a law of large numbers, that in this case, the, um, the proportion, the random proportion of, um, of infectives uh, will actually follow the deterministic one in the, the, the differential equation solution for a very long period, for a time period, which is of a duration exponential in n. Um, 
Now, on the other hand, if uh, uh, lambda is less than mu i r naught is less than one, then um, as we said, in a deterministic model, the population heads towards extinction uh, exponentially fast. Now for the stochastic model, on the other hand, um, that happens as well. So basically, the, um, we had this somewhat complicated looking formula, but the essence of it is that the, um, the time to extinction behaves like, um, um, well, if, uh, if, if mu greater than lambda is a constant, no, no, no n dependence, basically the time is of order log n, okay, the time to extinction. And you can uh, estimate the, the randomness in it quite carefully, okay, uh, quite, um, quite precisely. Um, so um, that, that's the basic essence of the statement. Um, now, um, and I, for the purpose of the something I'm going to say next, I'm rewriting this formula in terms of um, um, the um, uh, basic reduction number R naught. So, uh, so basically, it's um, it's the, the terms. Um, that there's a term at the front which is constant when R naught is a constant. Um, not, not, not anything close to one, and then there's the log n term. But if I start thinking of the case when R naught is a, a function of n, which I will in a moment, then this uh, term at the front, which is constant, actually will uh, tend, start tending to infinity. On the other hand, the stuff under the logarithm will no longer be log n, but something more complicated. So surprisingly, um, this, um, uh, there was a formula which existed for a very long time in the literature, um, which was wrong. And um, so the, the correct formula is in the paper that uh, I published with Graham Bartwell at Thomas House in J in uh, 2018. Um, so um, now I want to talk about um, the thing I wanted, um, the main subject of my talk, which is near criticality. Okay. So um, for the deterministic model, we said that the critical case is lambda equal to mu. Okay. Now. Um, when you want to extend this notion uh, to the stochastic model, actually it's not just lambda equal to mu that's the, the, key, um, the key point. Actually, there is a, uh, you have to think of it in, term of a whole, in terms of a whole window. So you think of um, um, having the difference between lambda and mu as something small of the order um, o, of n minus, uh, and, uh, o of n minus one half. So basically you're thinking of lambda as a function of n, okay, as a function of the population size, and you think of the um, um, recovery rate mu as a function of n as well, and uh, you're thinking of the um, of a lambda of n and mu of n being such that the absolute value of the difference is at most a constant times n to minus one half. So it's not not it's it's being small enough, not necessarily zero, but being small enough, okay. And so um, um, some things are known about what happens when. When you are in that critical window um, from earlier work by Doring, Sachs, and Sander 2005, and Dogra, Shinning, and Lali 2006. The basic message is that the time to extinction is of the order n to one half. Okay, so we had the, um, the exponential in n above the threshold and logarithmic in n below the threshold and in the critical window is n to one half, and one can say more precise things and depending on exactly where you start from. Uh, but for the vast majority of states, it's n to one half. Um, now, uh, you can also then try and connect the supercritical uh, and the subcritical to the, um, the critical window. So you can think of um, um, what happens if I take uh, lambda equal to lambda of n and mu equal to mu of n and uh, lambda minus mu tending to zero, but not being quite as small as n to minus one half. So when lambda, so that's sort of being kind of supercritical, but not fully supercritical, okay? So, um, so we, we phrase it as saying that lambda minus mu uh, times square root of n tends to infinity, okay? Um, so then the epidemic um, will take a long time die, to die out. And in fact, the formula connects with the formula known as supercritical case. And um, uh, this was sort of more non-rigorously shown um, in, um, in the work of Nazel. And recently, I believe it's rigorous. There's a 
uh, preprint of Eric Foxall, where I think he, he's done that rigorously um, to show that in, the, in the fact in a supercritical regime you, you do connect to the formula. So in the, in the, in the, so I call it really basic, I call it barely supercritical regime. So uh, the barely supercritical regime uh, connects the formula in a, super, in a strictly supercritical regime. Um, Okay, now on the other hand, in the barely subcritical sub sub regime, that also covered in the paper uh, of mine with Graham Brightwell and, and Thomas House, I've already mentioned, where basically we show again that the formula from a strictly subcritical regime um, does connect, um, uh, so extends to, to the case where um, mu uh, and lambda are both functions of n, mu minus lambda tends to zero, but in such a way that mu minus lambda times square root of n uh, tends to infinity. Infinity, okay, so here, as long as um, the initial um, condition x n of zero, the initial, i.e., the initial number of infectives is at least of the order one over mu minus lambda then the formula holds. What's the significance of this initial condition? Well, the significance is that if your number of infectives initially is less than the order one over mu minus lambda, you can think of every initial infective as starting their own little outbreaks, and they all have probability about mu minus lambda of, of, um, of succeeding, and then if you don't have enough of them, then the chance that they succeed is very small, and so actually the epidemic will die out very much faster. So, um, um, so that's the formula. And uh, so what's the informal des description of the cause of the epidemic? So I told you that in a supercritical case, and also, that also in the barely supercritical case, wherever you start from, you're going to head to the quasi-stationary distribution, which is around the, uh, the, uh, the, the um, attractive fixed point of the differential equation. You're going to stay there for a long time, and make excursions to zero, and, um, and then finally succeed. On the other hand here, if you start in a state above n times one, minus R naught, the process is going to move very rapidly to, the, to, to be at a state um, of order around 1 minus R naught over, uh, times N. So rapidly meaning at a, um, in a time much less than the duration of the rest of the epidemic. Now they will spend the bulk of the time to extinction moving from that level, 1 minus R naught times N, to level about 1 over 1 minus R naught. And in, there, in that regime, we will follow the differential equation quite closely. And then most of the randomness comes from the final phase, um, where, you are, uh, where you start in a level about 1 over 1 minus R naught with your number of infectives. And then um, in that regime, one can ignore the quadratic effects in the drift and approximate by the linear birth and death chain and get the, the gamble randomness in the distribution. Um, so, what are the key features of this barely subcritical regime? Um, so, uh, so, I want to make the hypothesis that it's actually common to a wide class of epidemic models um, uh, in, in such barely subcritical regimes. So, um, Basically, um, the hypothesis will be that the time of extinction is actually of the order much more than log n. So I said in a subcritical regime, the, um, the time to extinction would often be of the order log n. And we claim that that gets larger when you become, when your R naught becomes closer to, to 1. And uh, it's a bit of a wild guess. I don't know whether it's really true uh, that it's going to be uh, of the order 1 over 1 minus R naught with log of uh, n times some polynomial of 1 minus R naught. Um, we're not really sure. It's just of a, um, a wild hypothesis which people could try and look at whether it makes any sense in more complicated models. And we also think that uh, there'll be a period of time uh, before extinction which will be of the order in duration of about 1 over over one minus R naught, where the number of infectives will follow a track which will resemble a, a random walk and will remain of the order at most one over one minus R naught throughout. And the precise duration of this period is not going to be very well concentrated, i.e. not very well determined by the model parameters. So um, what, is, uh, what this connects to is something called cutoff phenomenon for Markov chains. So what is the cutoff phenomenon? It's something people study quite um, a lot in the context of various Markov chains. It says that the time to uh, converge to equilibrium, which in this case is to 
time to extinction is um, in duration much greater than the window over which the probability that you have already become extinct goes from near zero um, to near one. So in a more general context of Markov chains, you're thinking of uh, the window over which the total variation distance between the distribution at time t and the equilibrium distribution goes from near one to near zero. So, um, um, so we, we're claiming that uh, uh, there's a cutoff phenomenon present here if you go strictly subcritical case. So uh, the, um, the expected time to extinction uh, is of order log n 1 minus r naught squared over mu times 1 minus r naught. And uh, the window of extinction is of order 1 over 1 minus r naught. And you see that this cutoff or the concentration will become less pronounced as you approach the critical regime when 1 minus r naught becomes of order at most n to minus 1 half. And so again, the hypothesis will be that that weakening of the cutoff or the concentration around the window will be a feature of many other barely subcritical epidemic processes, but we haven't studied enough to, to really know. So it's something just to put out there, maybe people see it in their own uh, work. Um, so obviously for most purposes, it, this model is way too simple to to, to, to really be useful, although I know that some in practitioners have used uh, model, this, this simple model to study uh, hospital-acquired infections and other things. Um, so, uh, so I want to just uh, I'll show you a picture in a moment that um, uh, will basically show the behavior of this SIS logistic epidemic for a uh, population of uh, quite large size, I don't know, 10 to the 6, and uh, it shows and what happens as your R0 becomes closer and closer to 1? So we're trying to compare to sort of smooth exponential decay that you'd have if you are in a subcritical case and following the differential equation quite well. And we, we see the, close, the, 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 the closer the R0 becomes to 1, which is uh, the, so the, final, the final picture in the right-hand bottom corner is the R0 is the closest to 1, 0 0.995. The wilder it becomes and the less, uh, the less, it, uh, the less resembling the smooth exponential decay and, and the more you see this something which we think of as sort of random walk-like behavior in the final stages of the process. So, um, so it would be nice to see more uh, in other kinds of models whether people can replicate uh, that sort of behavior, whether they see it in, in, uh, in the context of other models. Um, so uh, we try to put it to some real data. Again, I, I, I don't, uh, I'm not sure I'm very convinced myself whether it really fits the, the limited data av available for these things. We, we try to look at it anyway. Um, Again, just something to think of, that uh, whether these, uh, these things, are uh, smallpox, polio, uh, Ebola, so uh, think of outbreaks towards the end. And uh, again, we think they are not very smooth. There's quite a lot of um, wild behavior towards the end, and which is uh, suggestive of what we think should be typical of barely subcritical epidemics. Um, now, in terms of, um, I know I have very little time, I just want to say a couple more things. So, in terms of taking it further to more complicated models, uh, so the next step, step up is to not think of one SIS um, logistic epidemic, but to think of a pair of them. So, um, um, we've been studying a model of um, two competing SIS logistic epidemics in a population of size n. So, here again, you have a closed population, and this time we uh, we, we don't have a birth and death chain, but we have a, um, a process basically in two dimensions. So we track number of infectives with one type of disease and number of infectives with a um, second type of disease. And uh, the dynamics is like in the other, in the case of a single uh, logistic epidemic. So when you have an infective individual of a given type, they will encounter a random other member of the population at rate um, lambda i for type i. If the person they meet is susceptible, they become infective with that type of disease. So that means we assume perfect cross immunity between two strains. If you're already sick with one strain, you can't get the other. Um, and also you have recoveries as before, independent of um, of the um, of the infection process, um, and, and again you can write down the rates for a Markov chain. And you see that if I remove uh, type two, then type one becomes a single uh, SIS logistic epidemic, and equally if I remove type one, then type two becomes a single individual, a single SIS logistic epidemic on its own. 
Um, and again, you can do write down a corresponding deterministic model, uh, which leads to differential equation. There are key parameters, which are the basic reproductive ratios for each disease. Uh, so lambda 1 over mu 1 is for disease 1, and lambda 2 over mu 2 for disease 2. And if you think of, say, the first one being stronger, you have a larger R0. And assume that it's both stronger and it's on its own supercritical, okay? Then, um, um, we, we can study, first of all, you can study the deterministic process and uh, the general result of uh, Zeeman for differential equations means that in the case where the first strain is stronger than the second and itself supercritical, this, the, the fixed point where corresponding to the first strain surviving and the second one going extinct is the, um, is the one that wins. So that's the globally attractive strain, that's where all the solutions will converge. And uh, so the weakest strain will die out, whilst the stronger one behave like the, um, uh, like in the deterministic SIS logistic model. Another question is how long it takes for the uh, weaker strain to die out. Okay, and um, again, you can study. Um, um, well, sorry, I mean, how long does it take to die out in a stochastic model? So, for the stochastic model, you again think of a sequence of these things, each for one for uh, each value of population size n. And uh, here, I'm, I'm looking at boring conditions. I know, I'll be one, I'll be one minute. I just want, to, I just want to get to the the statement of the result. It won't be, won't be much longer. So, um, we're starting from a sort of um, conditions where I'm assuming the epidemic is already uh, well established for both uh, first and second strain. There are obviously other initial conditions to study. And, uh, and there is a result which is an analog of the result we have for a single um, stochastic SIS logistic epidemic, meaning that the uh, second, the time for the second strain to die out, uh, the second meaning the weakest strain to die out, is uh, going to be logarithmic in N. Um, with some randomness which is described as a gamble distribution. Whereas the second one will, um, one can find out how, so that the, the, the stronger one, one can find out how long it takes to extinction by then looking, okay, after the weaker one has died out, then we just have a, a single a supercritical logistic epidemic, so you can read off exponential in N extinction time for that. And uh, um, basically what we, what we, and um, what, what one can do here is one can look at near criticality here as well. I don't have time to, to do that, but um, we, ha we haven't studied um, uh, near criticality in full, but have just looked at um, really uh, one kind of scenario where we assume that both um, um, recovery rates mu1 and mu2 are equal to 1. And um, so there are then eigenvalues for the differential equation around the fixed point, which one of them is of uh, is lambda 1 minus 1. The, the other one is lambda 1 minus lambda 2 over lambda 1. So we assumed one of the eigenvalues asymptotically as um, n goes to infinity, uh, um, and the lambda 1 and lambda 2 depend on n is somehow much smaller than the other. And then we can get a result that shows that the formula from strict subcriticality extend to this case as well. But this is, um, there's an awful lot more to study here, an awful lot more near critical regimes, and it's much harder than in the case of the uh, single logistic epidemic, because the, you, you, once you get to, to dimensions, the differential equation is much harder to understand. You don't have an explicit solution. Um, it's much harder to study um, with what happens. And so, so a lot of this is work in progress. But there is a, um, the, the, the things that, that I haven't really had time to discuss, but just mentioned briefly, that's in a preprint of mine with uh, my former postdoc Fabio Lopez, which is currently in review uh, for, a, for a journal and uh, yeah, and more, more work to follow hopefully in, uh, in coming years. So thank you very much for your attention. Sorry for running over. I've got a simple question. I don't need the mic, but, but <laughs> sure. Uh, so, so what would happen if you basically your argument is based on the law of large numbers and then you know some interplay between the asymptotic of of, of the R naught and 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 the large volume approximation? What happens if you write the diffusion equation for this? 
I, I don't know. I haven't written a decision because that would be Wisconsin. the obvious thing to do, right? You're looking sort of at the second order asymptotics when you're looking at the law of large numbers, right? So that would be eto diffusion type of behavior. So. Wouldn't it be useful to maybe write just just the the, the, the stochastic equation that governs? Them? I mean, for the I think for the for the single uh, logistic epidemic model, I think you, you get all the information you need from looking at the um, law of large numbers and the um, and then approximating with linear Beth and F chain. I, I can't rule out then that one can get some uh, useful information when you get to. Um, Two competing ones or further up uh, in the regimes we can't, I can't understand, but just a lot of large numbers, but we haven't done that yet. But, but if you're looking at the, uh, if you're looking at the eta diffusion, then you basically are looking sort of at the, at, at the rate of convergence and the law of large numbers, right? So that should be. Um, you, but you don't need to, there are other ways of looking at, uh, there, are, there are other ways to study the rate of convergence in the law of large numbers than eta diffusion. So, uh, so indeed, um, uh, part of the argument does involve quantitative law of large numbers, and which, in, which is in fact, well, I, I mentioned somewhere along the way that, say, in a supercritical logistic epidemic, you actually can uh, get a approximate Approximation, which is valid not for a bounded interval, but for a time of length exponential in n, and that's that's based on a very careful um, Martingale argument, uh, which studies the, the deviations very very precisely, and using using the fact that um, using the fact that basically that the uh, the differential equation is attractive, so using the fact that somehow the errors are self-correcting rather than just a standard thing. So it, may, it probably is in, in spirit, actually, uh, are quite related. It's just a, a different way of um, arguing about it. I think, actually, at the meeting in 1988, uh, yeah. Anders Martin Luth uh, uh, looks at the diffusion approximation to the SIS epidemic. I can't, I can't remember. I think it might have even been in the critical, mm -hmm. on the critical yeah. scaling. But, yes. Uh, but I think that, yeah. that was the case. But, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the other way would be to use the large deviations. But Again, I think that's related as well to the people who do large deviations. They, they, it's all, it's all about carefully outing and uh, analyzing uh, mounting ALF errors. So it's just uh, different ways of uh, of writing things down. That's, uh, that's what I think anyway. <laughs> Since you mentioned other types of models, I was wondering whether you would be interested in the SIR model with demography, where you would have a second parameter, which is the ratio of the two timescales, the timescale of yes. demographic turn so, uh, turnover and the timescale of transmission. Yeah. And I think in one extreme, you have extinction after the first outbreak. Yes. In the other extreme, you have this yes. exponential yes. duration, yes. but there should be a transition. Yeah. So, so I, I have worked on um, uh, near criticality in the context of SIR model with Svante uh, Janssen and another postdoc of mine, Peter Windage, and also actually with Thomas House. So we have a paper. But actually, oh. uh, cu curiously, we had, um, this, is, this is in the configuration model. Curiously, we actually have trouble um, uh, figuring out what what happens at least in the context of this model in a subcritical epidemic? It could be to do with the with the fact that the distribution can have different tails, the distribution of the susceptibles. So, uh, so I, I find it a bit unsatisfactory because in the context of that model, actually, we can analyze barely supercritical, but we can't analyze barely subcritical. So it's obviously in, uh, some of it is um, having techniques which are a bit particular to the kind of model. But uh, I think I think uh, any model, sub, uh, sub both ba barely super uh, super critical and barely subcritical are, are definitely very interesting to study. But it's hard to simulate. So it's often very hard to actually um, to, 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 to confirm the, the results you, you have um, uh, theoretically with, with computational simulation. But because I was actually thinking of a case where R0 is definitely bigger than 1, okay, yeah. but where you would have in one extreme of this other parameter extinction after the first outbreak because okay. demographic turnover is just too slow okay. to keep it alive. Um, and then when turnover is quicker, yes. uh, if it's very quick, uh, yes. you have exponential duration in terms of the population size. Yes. But there should be a transition, and to characterize no, that I transition. No, I think it sounds very interesting. I, I, maybe you can, um, during the break, and tell me yeah. the model uh, exactly, because I've, I, I would like to look at that, yeah. Okay, uh, thank you for your model. Um, another suggestion which I think you can 
also very easily do is instead of having a constant mu and lambda, mm -hmm. you just take an arbitrarily function of time. Mm -hmm. Even yes. in the discrete time, you can yeah. just generate the, uh, uh, the differential equation yes. with the help of Olo. I did it five years ago. Okay. So, uh, and you have nice integral and a yeah. closed analytic formula. Yes. And so, your death and birth is, is, is a very also time dependent, you can do it. Yes. But only for a single holistic epidemic, right? No, no, a single yeah. one, yeah. yeah. On the complete, get, I, I call it on the complete graph, yeah. Then, then you can do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, um, I mean, do you have any particular um, uh, way of varying in time in mind, uh, periodic or well, anything? Any function yeah. can do. Okay, well, I need to talk to you. Uh, <laughs> I, I, need, I, need to, I need to talk to you because I'm definitely interested. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is a bit related to what uh, Odo was asking. Yes. Uh, so here you use a Markov model, logis yes. you know, logistic SIS, uh, mm -hmm. which I've, uh, we have done some work with uh, Frank and Tom on mm -hmm. uh, SIR with demography. Yes. Uh, exactly. And there in simulations, we don't understand it at all. We see that when um, or at least I don't understand it all. Okay. I still <laughs> speak with Frank and Tom. We see that if the number of infectives, uh, or once it goes to uh, extinction, mm -hmm. it uh, sp the number of infectives basically spirals out of the equilibrium. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. It doesn't go directly down. And with an SIS epidemic, uh, Markov SIS epidemic, you go directly to your equilibrium, you yes. don't spiral to it. Yes. Would that, uh, if you have, for example, SIS epidemic with a fixed infectious period, yes. would the leaving of the, which, can you say something about the leaving of the equilibrium? Would that also be a spiraling out or would that be a... Well, it was probably more about the differential equation, right? Uh, how the differential equation depends, the, the, the behaves, what the eigenvalues are, whether you have a spiral or not, right? Well, whether you spiral in, that's differential equations. Yeah. How you go out of it, I don't understand. Uh, I feel, but... I feel it's, um, it's to do with the eigenvalues of the differential equation, not so much of the stochastics. Yeah. Okay, I think we should uh, thank Melvina again for a very okay. nice talk. Thank you.